This is God's day. It's a good day. So let us rejoice. My name is Kim Gilliland. I'd like to welcome you to our online worship here at Cotamina Church. Just before we begin, just two announcements for your attention. First of all, we have our annual congregational meeting coming up on March 5th. Please come and share in that meeting. We always have an interesting time planning for the following year, reviewing the previous year. Please come. You're welcome to come. And also, our Kiev house is coming along quite well. We are nearing completion of construction and decorating. We're hoping to uh, get some painting done next Saturday. So if you are available and you like to paint, we have a house on 61 Bellevue Drive, which needs painting. If you're available, just walls, please come and help us. And also, we are expecting a family sometime in the next few weeks. So if you're able to volunteer your time to drive or do other tasks that need done, if you uh, speak uh, Ukrainian or Polish or another language that we could use, that would be helpful. And there's also a gift registry posted on our Cotton United Church Facebook page. Uh, there are things that we need. You can donate them. Please go to our Facebook page and see perhaps what you can help out with those items in those articles. With that in mind, let's come before God. Blessed be the God of creation, who watches over the assembly of the people. Come, let us worship the one who gives us life. Let us give praise to our shepherd and our friend. Would you pray with me, please? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we seek to be open to you today. Open our hearts and our minds to your grace of your spirit, that we will be willing and eager to learn more of your wonderful good news. Sometimes it can be uncomfortable to follow you. Sometimes we are required to change our attitudes or our way of doing things. <clears throat> Enable us to always be willing to surrender to your will and your way. We seek to embrace you as you have embraced us. <clears throat> and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So, today we're going to ask, be answering an interesting question, and the question is this. Is it reasonable to believe what we believe? Is faith in Jesus a reasonable proposition? That's a whole gist of what we're talking about today. And to start off, I'm going to share a story with you. <clears throat> this happened back when uh, we lived in Espanola, ministered there, and we uh, had three young boys there. Uh, under the age of six. Our daughter had not been born yet, so we had three sons. And one day, I came home from worship, just in time as I walked through the front door, just in time to see a dinner plate sailing through the air like a frisbee and, and, and meeting the patio door at the back of the house. I couldn't see who threw the plate, because there was a wall between me and whoever threw it from the front door. <clears throat> but it was like an interesting thing to watch. It was almost slow motion as a plate, like a frisbee, hurled through the air, hit the glass door, made a small puncture. The plate, of course, smashed and the glass began to crinkle from that little hole. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger and the crackly, 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 you could hear it until all of a sudden, all of the window, the glass plate door, was cracks, and it just fell down, crash, in one fell swoop. It was actually quite impressive, I must say. But now I was, I was wondering who exactly had thrown the plate. So I walked into the living room, looked around the corner, and there were our three sons, Andrew, John, and Stephen, by the piano, looking very guilty. So I said, okay, who threw the plate? And three fingers pointed at three other boys. No one wanted to take the blame. Okay, guys, be honest. I need to know who threw the plate. At which point, Andrew and John both pointed to Stephen and said, he did it. That was hard to believe, because Andrew was six and John was five, Stephen was two and was clutching tight to his teddy bear. I did not think 
just even through the plate, would he have even had enough strength? Would he have been able to do that with one hand while clutching his teddy bear? Didn't make sense. Boys, who threw the plate? Nobody owned up to it. And to this day, we still don't know who threw the plate. Because even years later, when I asked the boys who threw the plate, at that point, they'd all forgotten. But I knew it had to be either Andrew or Stephen, or rather Andrew or John, because Stephen was just too small. It was not reasonable to expect that Stephen could have thrown that plate through the glass window. Reasonable proposition. John Wesley, one of my mentors and heroes of the faith, the 18th century revivalist in England, said, Christianity, faith in Christ, must be a reasonable proposition. It must make sense. It makes no sense to believe in things that are false. It makes no sense to believe in half-truths. It makes no sense to believe in something for which there is no evidence. So faith has to be at least reasonable. You don't have to prove it. It doesn't have to be beyond the shadow of a doubt. It just has to be reasonable. Just like it was reasonable to believe that either Andrew or John threw that plate. I couldn't prove which one did it, but it was reasonable to believe that one of them did. Faith is the same way. We may not be able to prove faith. We may not be able to prove God. We may, may not be able to prove a lot of things. But faith must be a reasonable proposition. I think John Wesley was right. Faith has to make sense. It doesn't make any sense to believe in half-truths. It doesn't make any sense to believe in myths and legends. It doesn't mean we don't have questions. But at least faith must make sense. And that came clear to me when I was talking to a friend of mine when he came to Christ a few years ago. He was a lapsed Catholic, had uh, raised in a Catholic church, but had wandered away because he wanted to search out other world religions. Came back to Christianity in our church. And I asked him why. And he said that he came back to Christ because of the creation story in Genesis. And I was a bit surprised by that, and because he also had, had a scientific background. So I said, so, so tell me about that. What does it mean? He said, well, he compared different creation narratives in different religions. And one of them had a story of a, a, a turtle who was <clears throat> carved up into seven pieces or something, and the seven pieces got thrown around, and that became creation. Another creation narrative talks about an egg being smashed, and from that smashed egg comes creation. But my friend said that he couldn't make any sense of any of those from a reasonable standpoint, from a proper, reasonable, as a prop, reasonable proposition. But the story of Genesis was reasonable. Well, not scientifically accurate, and it's not intended to be. The way things were laid out made a lot of sense, written by a rational mind. And so he didn't take the Genesis stories literally. They made sense, and they became a reasonable proposition. And so we have the question, is faith in Jesus Christ, are the truth claims of Christianity reasonable? I say yes. And I'm going to give you three reasons today why I think that faith in Jesus is a reasonable proposition. The first one has to do with eyewitnesses. First-hand people to the events of the day. And there are many of them in the Bible. Peter was the rock of the apostles, the twelve apostles, one of the first apostles. And he is one of the eyewitnesses who witnesses to and testifies to Jesus and who he was and who he is. I'm going to read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 21. It says this, Paul writes, For we do not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when a voice came to him from the majestic, majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. 
We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message of something complete, completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is Peter's testimony about his encounter, one of his encounters with Jesus. In verse 17, he talks about Jesus receiving honor and glory from God the Father. He talks about a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is a story of the Transfiguration, at least part of it. And it shows up also in three of the Gospels, in Matthew 17, in Mark 9, in Luke 9. The Transfiguration is in all of those Gospels. And it describes in the Gospels in greater detail than what Peter talks about. Peter only says a few things about the Transfiguration, but it's clear that it is the same story. You can tell from the one line where the voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love with him, I am well pleased. The exact same words show up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is the same story by an eyewitness. And it's attested to by other eyewitnesses in the other Gospels. Why does Peter write this? I'll go back to verse 16. For we do not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter is telling the readers of his letter that they can believe it because Peter's testimony as a first-hand eyewitness is true. The other gospel writers were also witnesses. Matthew was indeed an apostle of Jesus. Mark, though not an apostle, got his stories from an eyewitness who was Peter before writing them down. Luke is the only one of the apostles who was not actually an eyewitness, and yet he gathered the eyewitness testimonies of other, apostles, of other disciples of the day and also did extensive reading before writing his history in the gospel. Eyewitness accounts. We see that also in the epistles, in Paul, in Peter, in James, in John, in Jude. These are all first-hand eyewitnesses to the events and the person of Jesus. James and Jude were brothers of Jesus. Even they were finally convinced that their brother was the Messiah. And there's no harder, no harder group to ever convince than your own family. And yet they saw their brother Jesus, what he did, what he meant, and they came to conclude that he was and is the Messiah. The first-hand eyewitnesses in the New Testament are consistent. Yes, they may differ in details, but they are authentic, and none of the differences that we read in the, in the New Testament makes any difference to the overall truth of the stories or the truth of the gospel which we proclaim. And so, because of that, I believe that faith in Jesus and the truth claims of Christianity are a reasonable proposition. And yet we have skeptics who will say, ah, yeah, but all the New Testament writers, they were all in cahoots, they fabricated these stories, and they made them sound real, but they're not. They're just trying to make a point that they know isn't true. And that's a reasonable argument, because certainly that has happened in history in the past. Even with my two sons, with a dinner plate, never finding out who threw it, because they, John and Andrew, were in cahoots. Could the gospel writers, could the epistle writers have been in cahoots? Certainly they could have been. So where else do we find evidence that what they say is true? Because there are, are other eyewitnesses, 
other witnesses to the events that we can also rely upon. And that's the second reason why Christianity is a reasonable proposition. The other witnesses that we see. The first ones I want to talk about are the Gnostics. They believed some things that were different than Orthodox Christianity believes, than the faith of Jesus that we understand. But we, but they still believed in Jesus and, and the basic truths of what he did. We didn't know exactly what they wrote until the 1940s when some shepherds were looking for some fertilizer in the Nile Valley. And when they were digging, they came across some alabaster jars. Large jars, like very large jars. And in those jars was a complete set of the Gnostic writings, which hadn't existed for over a thousand years. And so all of a sudden we have writings from these people very near to the time of Jesus. And we discover that Jesus, they believe Jesus also, was a real person that did the things that Jesus said he did. Gnostics. Next one, Josephus, a Jewish historian, not even a Christian, who lived from 37 CE to 100 CE, and his purpose was to write down the historical facts of the land of Judah in which he was a part. He acknowledges Jesus. He acknowledges the existence of Jesus, who he was, what people believed about him. In fact, in his one of his writings called The Antiquities, he writes this. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was called the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestions of the principal men among them, had condemned him to the cross, those who loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, so named for him, are not extinct to this day. This is Josephus, not even a Christian, no ulterior motives, writing about Jesus and who people believed he was. And not only did Josephus talked about Jesus. He also acknowledged John the Baptist, Herod, James, the brother of Jesus, Ananias, the high priest, and among others. He had no ulterior motives. He's simply writing the facts as he understood them. This is very compelling. It's a good reason, another good reason to believe that our faith in Jesus is a reasonable proposition. So we have eyewitnesses, we have other witnesses. The third reason why Christianity is a reasonable proposition is because so many people were willing to die for it. If we look at the early leaders of the church, the apostles, we see that they sacrificed a lot to share the gospel around the world as far as they could. In fact, they sacrificed even their very lives. And there is no better, more compelling reason to believe that someone believes what they say than to understand that they're willing to die for what they believe. People will not die for what they know to be untrue. People will not die for a lie. They may suffer for it extensively, but very few people will die for something that they know is not true. And yet we have many examples in the Bible and in history of people doing just that, even back to the first early Christians. Of the 12 apostles, 10 of them were martyred. Listen to this. James, the brother John, was killed by Herod in 44 CE. Matthew was martyred by the sword in Ethiopia. Andrew was in Odessa where he was crucified on a St. Andrew's cross. Peter was condemned to death and crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified the same way his Lord was because he did not find himself worthy. Jude, who is also known as Thaddeus, 
in the Bible was also crucified. Bartholomew was cruelly beaten and then crucified. Thomas traveled to India, where he was murdered with a spear. Philip suffered martyrdom in Heliopolis. Simon the Zealot was crucified, they believe, actually in Britain, where he went to share the good news. Matthias, who replaced Judas, who betrayed Jesus, was stoned and beheaded in Jerusalem. The fate of of the other James apostle was unknown. Of the twelve, only John is known to have died of natural causes. John, the writer of the Gospel of John, the writer of the Epistles of John, the writer of the Book of Revelation. Only he died of natural causes. The rest died for their faith. And not just the apostles. Other early Christians also were willing to die for their faith. Stephen, a deacon, was thrown out of Jerusalem and stoned to death. 2,000 other Christians suffered martyrdom in Jerusalem at about the same time. James, the brother of Jesus and the first bishop of Jerusalem, died at the age of 94 after being beaten and stoned and finally clubbed to death. Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria. Paul's faith was so dramatic in the face of martyrdom that the authorities removed him to a private place and executed him by the sword. Luke, the author of the Gospel, was reportedly hanged by an olive tree in Greece. The list goes on and on and on of people who were willing to die for their faith. The list is a long one. Again, people may suffer for something they believe is a lie, but many, very few people will die for something that they don't think is true. And yet these people were so rock solid certain of their faith that they were willing to sacrifice their very lives to believe it. These are people who walked with Jesus, many of them, or knew people who had walked with Jesus, who knew him, who had spent time with him. These people were the closest to him. And the evidence they knew allowed them to believe. Peter, one of the early Christians to believe. And so he witnesses about his own experiences. There were already lots of martyrs from the early church by the time he wrote his letter. And yet he writes it as a testimony of one who knew the events. There, is so, there are so many examples of why we should believe in the Bible, in history, in eyewitness accounts, that it seems to me wholly un- unreasonable not to believe with the evidence that is here today. I am willing to be rock solid certain in what I believe about Jesus Christ. I think it's reasonable to believe. I think it's reasonable for you to believe too. But most importantly, I believe in Jesus, that faith is a reasonable proposition, because I've known him as my Savior since I was 15 years old. I know the difference he's made in my life. I don't know where I'd be without him, by my side, within my heart, every single moment of every single day. The truth is that Jesus is the Messiah, the only Son of God Almighty. He lived to show us love and teach us justice. He sacrificed himself so that through faith in him we might have eternal life through his death and his resurrection. And so, like John Wesley, I believe that faith in Jesus is a reasonable proposition. And I hope you believe that too. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Let's pray. Holy God, you are in our world. You are in our communities. You are in our lives. You are in our hearts. You are with us every moment of every day. 
and for your constant presence we give you thanks and praise. You are with us in laughter. You comfort us in our tears. You lift us up in times of pain and offer us the healing protection of your enfolding wings. You come to us in love. We return to you in love. Although we have received our salvation by faith and not by works, it is a comfort and an inspiration to know that you care about the things that we do. Enable us to always do all that we can for others, taking full advantage of every opportunity to be an example of your love and grace. Thank you for your unconditional love and unfailing promises. We lift up in prayer those who are sick at home or in hospital this week. We remember especially Carol, Mark, and Ron. Bless them as you have blessed all of us with your healing and Holy Spirit. We pray also for the family and friends of Billy Taylor who went to be with the Lord and whose life we will celebrate later this week. Thank you for her life and witness. But we also pray with heavy hearts for the family of Blake and Matthew Fox. We pray, Lord, for the family, these two young men, tragically taken this week. Bring comfort, bring peace, bring our community, to get, community together to help to find healing. Oh God, you are our Heavenly Father, the one who nurtures us with care and support. It is our desire that we will always be willing to follow your leadership and instructions regardless of how it may appear to others. Help us to have courage and strength to go wherever and do anything that you ask of us. May we go without hesitation or reservation, confident that all things will happen according to your great purpose. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us this week. We look forward to seeing you again next time when we come before God to worship him and give him glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Go in peace. Amen.